I'm really excited to have a conversation with one of today's standout thought leaders, Mr. Chris Brogan, the CEO of Human Business Works. And I know he's on a tight schedule, so you can learn all about him from his website at chrisbrogan.com. And while you're there, I really encourage you to sign up for his weekly newsletter. If you want ideas and inspiration to make your business stand out from the crowd, that's really the place to get them from. So today I want to chat with Chris about his new book, The Impact Equation, co-authored with Julian Smith, and which takes a whole new perspective on what it means for anyone to make an impact on the world. So Chris, welcome. It's really great to have you here. An utter pleasure, Nigel. Thank you for having me. Oh, you, you're very welcome. And, uh, you know, the whole reason that we got together is a direct result of the impact that you're having. I subscribe to your newsletter, of course, and we connected very briefly on Twitter and exchanged a few messages. And before we know it, here we are on this, uh, on this call. So that's fantastic. Yeah, it just seems like a great way to walk the talk and just fun to get a chance to talk to the folks that you uh, tend to interact with. Cool. Well, let's start with a look at what impact means as you talk about it in the book. Uh, you define impact as getting a larger audience to see and act upon your ideas and learning to build a community around that experience to take it all to a higher level. Now, is this something that anyone can do no matter how small they might feel they are in the scheme of things? Um, I think so. I think it's one of these uh, scenarios where you can start where you are and you can do what you're capable of doing and understanding from it and then just sort of pick up as you go along and really get the sense of, I, you know, here's what I'm capable of and here's something I'm going to reach towards. And, and I think that's, that's true with everyone. I think what happens is we look at how other people have evolved or have built something or, or a position where someone is that, we're, that we, they come to our attention we think, oh, I could never be there. But of course, that person also thought they could never be there. They just kind of went a lot of different paths and found their way. Mm -hmm. Right. And what might this type of impact look like for someone such as a professional photographer, for example? You know, it's... Um, there's, for example, a professional photographer, my goodness, what a... What a dreadful uh, way to earn a dime these days, it seems, in some ways, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm not telling anything your audience doesn't know, Nigel. But, oh, you know, yes, exactly. You're exactly right. <laughs> uh, you know, they're, they're great pub mates, though. I mean, uh, professional photographers. Cause, uh, you don't really even have to get a pint in them. I suspect I could pour them, you know, apple juice, and they'd say, oh, these people these days with their iPhones and their Instagram. And, I, I, uh, and <laughs> you know, it's, it's utterly true, everything they said. So, I mean, how does a professional photographer stand out? Well, there's lots of things that an Instagram, you know, at arm's length photographer can't do. So, the impact equation has these six uh, points, and they're called contrast, reach, exposure, articulation, trust, and echo. And let me walk through the example of if I were uh, silly enough to be a pro photographer, uh, you know, what would I do to try to help people stand out? Uh, first, I'd, I'd push on the contrast the most. And the difference is, that, and not contrast in the way you use it in photos, but uh, how do I seem different from someone else? So, for instance, um, that photo that you're using on this particular video we're doing is shot by this guy, Chris Krug, who's a great photographer, professional photographer, and that is one of the best photos that someone's taken of me in the last couple of years. I repeatedly uh, use that photo right now for everything I can because it's so good, and I, and I don't use all the little photos I take of myself on my Macs and my iPhone. Um, so right away, there's a contrast. There's kind of a, I can do it better than you for your own good. You know, get one of these great pro photos done kind of experience. Mm -hmm. The other thing is, professional photographers, you know, oftentimes, say, let's say portrait photographers, can go way beyond what a regular person is capable of doing by setting up interesting shots, by doing really you know, interesting, exciting, avant-garde type work that still you can bring back to um, you know, the portrait world and, and get some of the business that you're not getting. And, it's, and, and Nigel, what people do is this. They say, uh, well, you know, that's the kind of work I used to charge this much for. Well, congratulations, unless you also have a TARDIS, uh, you don't get to charge that anymore. <laughs> and secondly, uh, what happens is they'll say, oh, but this is too complex for the average taste of a oh, portrait photographer, because normally we have those horrible screens that we slide down behind you, and we w squeeze the squeezy ball until the little baby looks at the right point, and you shoot. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. um, well, that's great, except I can buy that at Walmart now for $29. So um, really contrast and standing out is one of the most important ones. The second one is echo, uh, is the end of the impact equation, which is I see myself in this work or I'm the kind of person who would like this work. So there's a lot of people who don't want the standard photo, or there's a lot of people that even more so these days would love to mock the quality of a standard photo, and uh, it requires great skill to be able to make a mockery that's of value. And so I just think there's a lot of things pro photographers can learn from this concept to promote their business better, to get the kind of clients that they want, and to not feel like they have to follow the herd. Right, and uh, one of the, one of the things that I'm really big on is uh, helping photographers to try to understand why why it is that they do what they do. It's it's a very it's a very deep uh, introspection, and, and it goes way beyond the idea that oh well, I'm passionate about photography. I have a great eye. I love art. I love working with people. Well, any photographer should be able to say those things. And in fact, you know, you wouldn't go to a photographer who said, well, I'm not an artist. I hate people, and I really can't stand cameras or, or anything to do with that. But hey, I'll I'll, I'll take you a mugshot or whatever. So we have to go beyond that, and, uh, and a lot of times it comes from a, a much deeper need to share something with other people or to bring out that um, some quality that they see in other people that, that most people may not be able to see or or they miss. Uh, but you know, many photographers really fall into a big trap of thinking that their phot their photographs are able to create all the impact they need just by themselves. Uh, you know, it's like, well, my photography should sell itself, you know, which it really doesn't. Uh, so how might they bring real human impact into play to get their audience to truly appreciate and act upon what you might call their creative vision? And, and that's a, it's a really great point to make is um, there's a, this, it's interesting from whence this comes, but I was with my therapist of the time about a year ago, and we're having a conversation the thing and he says to me, well, do you want to be uh, Warhol or Van Gogh? And he was expecting me to answer Van Gogh because, of course, a, a much deeper uh, history, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I said, of course I want to be Warhol. He, he got <laughs> all the spoils early. You know, he didn't have to wait around until he was dead to be famous. And I want the money and the fame right now, thank you. And so photographers quite often fall into the Van Gogh trap. And, you know, they, I see myself in my art and whatever. And, you know, when you're just, there, there's a huge uh, uh, bifurcation, to use a giant word, there's a huge rift or a schism uh, with photographers insofar as am I making insanely artistic, artsy artwork or am I making, you know, craft artwork that I know someone will actually buy and there's some commercial viability. Um, to get them on your side either way requires letting people in to see the process, getting them to understand what goes beyond the frame. Um, remember that a photo or even a series of photos is, you know, a, a captured moment in time. Uh, yeah. Gio Geller, who's a friend of mine, has this great quote he told me, we're walking through the building, the Associated Press building, which is, you know, AP Newswire feeds many of the world's uh, newspapers as well as, as well as photos. And he's showing me these incredibly historic photos. And he, he's, he's touching them all as if he took them, by the way. And he says, uh, you know, a photo is a perfect capture of a moment that never really happened. And, of course, what he's saying is that, you know, sometimes photography doesn't catch the truth. It catches, you know, an instant mm -hmm. of a moment. And so when he said that, I've never looked at a photograph different, the same way again. I always have a very different perspective on what I see captured. And so what's a photographer? for to do, they have to break the, the fourth wall and shoot video talking about what their process is. They have to maybe blog and or write newsletters or whatnot to say what's going on. And again, look for echo, look for trust, get people to understand the human behind things. This gives you more exposure to the contents of what an artist is doing and what a, what a photographer is doing with their art. Mm -hmm. And that's, I think, this is, it's a super long answer, Nigel, to a simple question. It's a, it's a great answer. And, uh, and, it, it, and that in itself echoes uh, something that the great wedding photographer, Jerry Giannis, uh, said not so long ago about telling the story that exists beyond the frame. We have to use words to communicate the story of the image to our clients and prospects so that they get a perspective of what's really happening in that image because, as you say, it's, it's, it's a split-second 
capture it mean it doesn't it, it tells a sort of an emotional story but at the same time there are elements outside the frame that the that somebody new to that particular image may not understand or see and when they do understand it then they really get it that that the emotion in the image really connects with them and and, and creates a real emotional response and so in in your book you you talk a little bit about things like social media and all that kind of thing and you make the point that the book is not really about how to use social media tools uh, per se and of course marketing today seems to be all about Facebook and Twitter and Pinterest and Google Plus and all these uh, social networks and there seems to be something of a gold rush every time a new one pops up but you know is it really all about the social networks when it comes to creating impact it's not. It's it's about finding humans where they are and connecting with them in a way that you can. Um, you know, uh, in looking at the work of Jerry Giannis, for instance, I mean, any one of these, quote, simple wedding photographs uh, <laughs> would make an insanely beautiful poster. And uh, getting that kind of work into the hands of people uh, in a very inexpensive way that would get it put into, you know, simple for prints or whatnot wouldn't necessarily make Jerry a great deal of money, but would give him a lot more reach and exposure, which would then lead towards more more business opportunities. And so um, that's, I mean, I'm saying make posters and prints. This is, there couldn't be anything less social media than that. Mm -hmm. uh, but, um, I mean, the other, one of the larger pieces of the book, the book is broken into four major concepts. One is goals, one is ideas, one is platform, which includes these social networks but also other things. And the other is network and how do you make people care. Um, just sticking with Jerry Giannis, just for a fun example, um, what Jerry's done with an idea perspective on how to make his ideas have more contrast is um, he's taken something as simple as wedding photographs and making them, uh, made them somewhere between romantic and erotic. I mean, there's some of these shots that I look at and I just think, I, I don't know that I'd want someone to see this photo of my new bride because I'd imagine they'd have a different opinion in their mind right away. Maybe I would. Maybe I'm so filled with pride at that moment. But, uh, but I would say that the, the, the beauty, just the absolute imagery, is different than your standard wedding photo. I mean, there's just so many great captured moments that are, you know, above and beyond your wedding photo that that's where the impact is. That's the, the impact is that the idea is so great. The non-social media side, Nigel, is to, uh, to to bob where everybody's weaving. And sure, use Pinterest. Use Google+. Plus. Google+, Plus is like the ultra hangout of uh, photographers now. But that's like saying, hey, there's this bar where everyone's trying to hit on this one girl. You should go there, too. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And, and, and as well, you know, it, it all depends on... Who, which part of your target market is hanging out there? I mean, if you're an executive headshot portrait photographer, you don't really need to be hanging around on Pinterest too much, you know, because it's populated more by uh, moms and that kind of thing, you know, uh, certainly at this early stage. Um, yeah. And, you know, and I know that in the, in the book you, you make uh, a big mention of the fact that really it's not about the social tools. It's about the message and it's about the impact that that message has on the person at the other end. Exactly. I, I mean, I spoke to a room full of people just yesterday, Nigel, and it was this um, organization of pre uh, presidents of companies, and they have such and such a revenue and all that. And these people ran moving and storage companies, textile companies, a paper factory. This man made napkins for a living. And he just, I mean, I had this, this is a tough crowd, Nigel, because they're saying, well, what are you going to teach me, monkey boy dance? And... Uh, I all I had an idea for all of them one at a time, um, and it's it, it, the same kinds of things could could apply internal to one's business. Now, of course, you know photographers are fairly thin business. Usually, it's one human, and maybe if you're lucky, a couple. <clears throat> but um, the concepts of the book have nothing to do really with jump on Twitter and get famous. We paint with those brushes a great deal because we find that given the options of mainstream existing traditional ways to promote and get people to understand where you are in the world, uh, there's just not enough attention being gleaned there. Whereas this, this social shiny world, once you get people to go beyond paying attention to you, hopefully you, you want them to know your story. You want them to share what you've got and then maybe even feel some emotions and then a deeper trust with you. And that's something I think happens a lot easier using the online tools. Mm -hmm. and, and that kind of connection that, you, that we make with people on that level,
translates then into things like really positive word of mouth marketing where that message gets spread almost hopefully virally but even even if it's not really truly viral it spreads amongst their friends and family and they, and they and they talk positively about what we're doing because they feel that emotional connection with it through all those factors of trust and echo and that kind of thing right and that's it's in looking through i mean poor people who are forced to pay attention to this video and listen will hear me just repeating a lot of the same uh, comment, which is this just isn't about the tools. And, and the reason I'm doing that is because for the last few years, I'm sure that your audience and everybody else have just been bombarded with, if you just get on Facebook, everything will be better. You can start just cashing checks. Don't worry. They're right there for you. Just mm -hmm. get on the Facebook and you will be rich. And uh, I guess I'm trying to be a little bit of a, uh, a bit of vinegar into your uh, juice. <laughs> because I think I want you to have that sense that there's there's a wee bit more work than that. Right. So uh, I know your time is precious. I just have a couple more questions before we uh, before we finish up. And uh, the first one is, you know, if you wanted to start out from scratch, let's say that Chris Brogan woke up tomorrow morning and said to himself, "Hey, I'm going to be a photographer." You know, I've never done photography as a business before, but my girlfriend says I take great photos with my brand spanking new shiny camera. So I'm going to go out there and start a business as a photographer. How might you go about building the right audience, one that's going to resonate with what you do and hopefully respond by investing in your work? It's really funny because you're asking this question at the exact same moment that someone was telling me that they uh, plan to be making. Uh, they're starting a new business where they're going to be selling uh, uh, iPhone and iPad um, accessories and whatnot. And they wanted to know where's the community for people who buy iPhone accessories. And I said, no, there isn't because could you imagine a less interesting community than a bunch of people talking about iPad cases all day. <laughs> um, and, and that's really what I just sent him uh, back. And so the same is true with photographers. I mean, a, a lot of times what happens is you need to remember that everyone belongs to more than one community. We'd, we'd kill ourselves. We'd absolutely slice our faces open if we had to stick with one community because let's say you're a parent and what, if you only hung out with your, your children's you know, football mates or whatever, you'd, you'd lose your mind. Uh, if you're a, a book reader, you maybe love spy novels, but you don't want to hang out with you know, the Ian Fleming crowd. Um, so one thing you need to realize is that you have to have at least two communities. One for your, to get your enthusiasm uh, fed and all that sort of thing. And that's, of course, the kind of community that you run. I mean, that's Xenolog and all that is to really help people, uh, you know, learn their skill, learn their craft and connect. So you need, the, you need the sort of enthusiast education side of your business. And then all you really want to do is start thinking about what your buyer would want and what would attract them and either start finding the communities through search and, and looking around in various social ways through Google and the like, or make the kind of information that would make your buyer excited and thrilled. Uh, if you're a, you know, a corporate headshot photographer, then uh, what do people care about when they're buying your service? They want to know that you're reliable. They want to know that you're uh, efficient. They want to know that you're whatever. I mean, that's very mechanical stuff. If you're a portrait kind of a person like uh, Jerry Giannis, um, they want to know that you're going to bring a really high-level quality product. And, and so you start telling stories about what you sell, but in a way that is all about the buyer's perspective and what makes them the hero. Mm -hmm. And that's content marketing is what we call it in, in the marketing space. But... I mean, really, ultimately, what you're doing is you're just equipping someone to know that they're making the right choice by going with you. And, and I'd say create it even if it doesn't exist, um, and then visit the places where it does exist, but invite people back to your pad every now and again to see what you have to do. And it's not just your portfolio. People, people make the mistake of thinking that the very next thing after um, having you know, decided they're going to go digital is they make the portfolio and call it a day. Uh, first off, a lot of these portfolio pages are using uh, flash technology, which is invisible to iPhones and iPads. Mm -hmm. So you're already, you're already losing a good chunk of your, your viewership. And I would say that uh, there's a stat I know for the U.S., and I don't know how it plays in Europe and elsewhere, but uh, in the U.S., about 68% of uh, web traffic coming to your site now is mobile. And so if that mobile service is coming through smartphones, which a good majority of it is, then you are accidentally throwing away a lot of potential customers by using technology that is not visible to them. Yeah, yeah, I, I would definitely echo that. Um, 
in fact, I recently made the switch to uh, to using the Genesis framework and uh, their themes for, for the Xenolog site purely because of the mobile responsive aspects. Uh, plus, you know, it, the, the, it's all ran great software and I love those guys at Copyblogger and Studio Press anyway. Uh, but, uh, you know, the, the, having the, the website visible on a on a mobile device and uh, not just visible but you know they don't have to get that little microscope page will start pinching and s screwing around with the screen uh, makes a big difference and you're right there is a lot of traffic coming to our sites now from from mobile users and we have to think about you know the, the speed at which they can consume the content and how quickly we can get the message across uh, so uh, excellent point so uh, before we finish up uh, can we talk very quickly about work discipline you know we've mentioned throughout this that this takes a little bit of extra work this isn't just a case of just throwing up a social media profile throwing a portfolio online and sitting back and waiting by the mailbox for checks to come in um, you know, we look at other successful business owners sometimes and we imagine that they must somehow have more hours in a day than us or they don't have to deal with all the mundane stuff like the rest of us do or perhaps they have an army of elves working for them or something. You know, how much effort and commitment does this stuff really take and is there a magic bullet anywhere? I wish there were magic bullets, but if there were then it would nullify the space truly because if everyone could do it simply then everyone could do it uh, again photographers remember you've already seen this they call it the iPhone and that's wiped out a good chunk of people's business because good enough has replaced good mm -hmm. um, but the answer uh, you know I was really strange as you started asking the question I thought to the victor goes the spoils but that's not really what I'm saying here I'm saying to the hard worker goes the spoils but when I think of hard worker probably like yourself I mean uh, our parents' version of hard work was really kind of grinding away for not much loot, and you know the the sense of the factory world that came in the in the uh, generation before us, or maybe the one right before that, um, is what we think of when we think of hard work, and that's not what I'm uh, espousing. But what I think is that um, I always ask the question back when someone says this seems to take a lot of time. I always ask, well, you know, is prospecting for new customers too? Uh, low on your priority list that you shouldn't find time to do it? Uh, what are you doing with your time if prospecting for new customers isn't possibly one-third of your small business? And I always get, you know, well, I'm very busy with the work I already have. And I say, great, if it keeps paying you and then recurring, you know, timelessly, then you're, you're fine. But the minute you finish the job, then you finish the, the, the revenue that goes with that work you're busy with. Mm -hmm. um, and I also don't accept that I'm too busy to use social networks and use these digital tools because on one side of the spectrum, I've, I've had the, the, the lovely opportunity to spend time and speak with Sir Richard Branson. The man runs 400 companies. He's one of the wealthiest men in the world, owns an island, um, and he has time to use Twitter and Google Plus and all these things quite effusively, just all the time. Um, on the other side, there's these two, two blokes up in Maine who run a... Uh, uh, brewery and it's just two guys. One guy runs the, he's like the lawyer and officially the bottle washer. He like, you know, <laughs> sterilizes the bottles for, for real. And the other guy is the chief financial officer and the brewer and he makes the beer. And they both use social platforms to get their word out and they're making money off of it. So I just can't accept I'm too busy. I, I'm a three person company and I'm the only one doing the outreach and uh, all my money and revenue comes from digital channels. So uh, well, it doesn't hurt that I have a couple books out there, but you know the the revenue is all dr drawn inward from these digital channels. So I just have the sense that uh, people's excuses, more often than not, have nothing to do with uh, I don't have the time. What they're really saying is I just don't know where to start putting my effort. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you, you're, you're quite right. And then you know, and I hear people talking about things like, oh well, you know, did you see Honey Boo Boo on TV last night, and and all this kind of thing. And I was like, I don't. As you know, as charming, <laughs> for want of a better word, as Honey Boo Boo might be, I don't really want to invest my time in that space. You know, I I would much rather, you know, do something that works, or puts me closer to my goal than, you know, trying to figure out, you know, <laughs> what Honey Boo Boo is up to or American Idol or any of those other shows. Not that there's anything wrong with them. You know, I mean, if you have time, then that's that's fine. But uh, I can't, you know, as you said in, in a great interview with Copyblogger, you know, with uh, Robert Bruce, I remember you saying that you, know, you can't, you, you don't, haven't found a way to, to actually get paid for watching American Idol yet. 
I would love to. I, you know, I, I don't like television very much, but I mean, if there was a, a check in it. Well, I'll tell you this. Um, I, I would sooner try to figure out great BBC shows. Um, I only get them through things like Netflix and mm -hmm. long after you've already forgotten these shows. But um, I just watch them and I just forever shake my head at American television and say, why? Why do we try? Well, uh, you know, I, I enjoyed your, your little Doctor Who reference earlier on. Uh, I'm a big Doctor Who fan, so I, that's one of the things that I do. I do take some time out to keep up with uh, my fr my time traveling friend Doctor Who. But uh, <laughs> see, well, there it is. I mean, we all have our passion, right? But yeah. I think I mean your point, Nigel, though, is that um, it, it, people always reveal themselves. The moment they tell me they have no time in a day, as you say, the very next question is, you know, did you see, did you see you know Manchester trounce such and such, you know, Leeds or somebody, Liverpool, and that's the end of that. I mean, you immediately know where their priority is, and I just. Uh, my priorities, I would love to have such a flow in my business that when I take a day off and just look at the sky for the whole day, then I feel like I can still cash a check later. <laughs> well, listen, Chris, you're a true superhero, and uh, I want to thank you for spending time with us here today. It's been really valuable. I, I've really enjoyed this this chat, and I could I could sit here and, and, and chat with you all day about it, but I know that you've got... Uh, Better and bigger things to do. Uh, the work you do and the ideas that you share with the rest of us are immensely valuable at making us think harder about who we are and how we impact the world around us. And uh, and before we go, how can folks get uh, more inspiration from you? I know we have your website address up there on the screen, uh, chrisbrogan.com, but uh, is that the main place for people to go? It is. You know, if you show up at chrisbrogan.com, at the very top there's something that says that I want to share my best ideas with you, and it's, a, it's an email newsletter. It comes out every Sunday, which is uncommon for newsletters, and what you'll find is it's very uncommon as a newsletter. And I guess if there was only one thing I wanted to tell you is that get involved with me there, because not only is it a newsletter, but you can just hit reply and talk to me anytime you want, and I can answer whatever questions you have and, you know, do whatever. Just... When you go through that process and you do decide to reply, don't sell me your dumb thing because I don't want to buy it. <laughs> right, and you know, and I've, I've been receiving your newsletter on that on Sunday, and I, I I really look forward to getting it. There's always always something in there that is very uh, thought provoking, uh, something that you know comes comes at things from a different angle, really gets people thinking, and uh, and I want to thank you for for sharing those things with us. Well, I'm very grateful that you're there. And uh, you mentioned earlier something I just want to correct, which is that you thought I might have bigger or better things to do. Um, never. Um, spending time talking to you is the most important part of the day today. And so thank you for that. And thereafter, I guess what I'll say is that um, we all are the most important person, and so that includes you. So thank you for your time today. Uh, well, thank you, Chris, and you have a great day. Thanks.